the Faith and Base Podcast, 057, The Great Commission, The Promise. Well, finally, now let's look at possibly the most neglected statement of the Great Commission. After Jesus issues his four crisp commands, comes the magnificent and stunning conclusion. Let's read the entirety of the Great Commission again. It's been a while since we've heard it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. Jesus concludes his commission with an amazing and wonderful promise. And surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. This is truly the most amazing promise ever made. There are no words to adequately describe the implications and impact of these final words. Jesus' promise permeates through the rest of the New Testament. For the last two millennia, the promise has changed millions of hearts and lives and will continue to do so until the very end of time. Majestic and marvelous, the promise secures a Christian's future in the eternal kingdom of God. It's a promise of comfort and a bond of sonship. It is intimate and loving. It's beyond earthly comprehension. Jesus promises to be with us always until the very end of the age. And by the way, this is exactly what he said he would do way back in John 14. This came at the time of the Last Supper as he shares his heart with the apostles he loves. Let's listen. John 14, 15 through 31. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All of this I have spoken while I was still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak to you much longer, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Wow, what an awesome and wonderful position we are in. The God of the universe, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Alpha and Omega, the Light of Life of Men, the Word Incarnate, that Carpenter of Galilee, will voluntarily come to me and live in me for the purpose of his will. That's wild. That is blow away. Now notice, in both John 14 and the Great Commission, all of this wonder is predicated on a very specific response to Jesus' teaching and invitation. The only appropriate response to his conditional call is obedience. 
John 14 compels soft-hearted people to ask, How do we do this, Lord? What should we obey? By Matthew 28, 18, he tells them, The promise follows and is only available to those who obey the Great Commission. The promise of the Great Commission is beyond words, truly amazing in its blessings. The God of the universe comes and makes his home in us. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, indwells us. This all happens at a point in time after our sins have been wiped away by God. The Holy Spirit will not indwell a house which has not been swept clean. It happens because Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us. He died on the cross and rose from the grave so we can be freed from sin and death. Because of what he has done, he's opened the way so we can live with God in heaven for all eternity. Our response to this is not a legalistic or man-made response. It is in humble obedience to all that he commands, and it comes from a heart filled with deep gratitude and a love for Christ. Without objection, protest, or argument, we simply obey all that he's taught us. Our love for Christ and our gratitude for what he has accomplished on our behalf drives us forward. It compels us to honor, respect, adore, and cherish Jesus as our Lord with every fiber of our being. We lay down our lives before his throne. We fall on our knees before his majesty. We dedicate our lives to his service. We desire to know him in deeper, more intimate ways by reading his word and pursuing our relationship with him in prayer to the Father that we may know him better. When we're so converted, we crave things spiritual and our minds become squarely set on heavenly things. Love is an action, not just an emotion. Therefore, a disciple of Jesus possesses a go anywhere and do anything mentality and heart. We are humble and eager to learn anything new. We're willing to change quickly when we learn that we've been wrong. This of course implies that we're in relationships which lovingly challenge our thinking. We have this heart because we clearly recognize how lost and depraved we actually were without Christ. We truly understand how deceived and empty our lives were prior to discovering this life to the full, which is only found in Christ. A relationship with Christ results in overwhelming feelings of boundless joy, incomprehensible peace, and deep contentment. This is why we talk about Christ. We love sharing this good news with our brothers and our sisters who have experienced the same thing that we have and with those who have not yet discovered it. I will be with you always is the last thing Jesus tells his disciples. And it is within this context we consider what we talked about in our last lesson, accountability. We have our commission. We have our marching orders. We are to take the gospel to the world. We are to go. We are to make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything that we have been taught. So, how does Jesus' amazing promise to be with us always relate to accountability in our evangelistic efforts? Think this through. When you have a group of people absolutely stoked about their relationship with God, they should be eager to do anything which fans into flames those feelings. If church leadership can provide just a little bit of structure for evangelism and a little bit of guidance, wouldn't you be all for it? Provide me with just a little bit of direction in the form of some common goals shared with my fellow workers, and I will stay focused and busy while I toil with my team to reach those goals. The God of the universe lives in me. Don't tell me to sit around doing nothing or worse yet, get involved in some unrelated church activity which leads me to substitute those efforts for evangelism. When church leadership communicates no common evangelistic goals, direction, and a way to measure success, members will most likely drift and wander aimlessly throughout their spiritual lives, rarely seeing the victory of bringing another soul to Christ and experiencing the sheer joy of teaching another person all that they have learned. Without common goals, direction, and a modicum of accountability, not only will church members drift 
frankly, most will leave. There's no greater purpose for a person's life than helping another person get to heaven. Is it not strange that every successful business understands and employs accountability among its members, but the church shudders at the thought of asking its team to be accountable for a far more important and eternal purpose? Our efforts impact people for an eternity. No company's products or services can make that claim. Our evangelistic goals, organizational plans, and accountability should put the greatest corporate programs to shame. Consider Israel. They always had goals. The Lord constantly set before them the task of advancing into new territory. For them, it happened through their various wars. Now take these military campaigns as a foreshadowing of our battle to save souls. While we no longer conquer physical territory with swords of iron, we conquer spiritual territory with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And, without question, it is a battle, a battle for souls. Jesus' magnificent promise to be with us always means that we will take on his continuing mission to keep moving forward by preaching and teaching the gospel. A well-trained mission team doesn't reject accountability. We embrace it because it helps us do what we want to do to an even greater degree by employing godly organization. The very fact that Jesus is in us drives us forward as a team on a quest to spread the message. How can we measure the effectiveness of a plan if there's no clearly defined attainable goals? no specific target, and no evaluation of the activity. We must have an evangelistic plan with clearly defined and clearly stated goals and objectives. When these are communicated to the troops, they have the ability to see their victories and experience amazing joy. Think about this carefully. Jesus promised to be with us always. What good is it if Jesus is going to be with us always until the very end of the age, if we never do anything as a result of the promise? What good is it to be saved if we never seek and save the lost ourselves? Did we get into Christianity just for fire insurance? May it never be. What good is it for God to give us his Holy Spirit if we're just going to go hide in our prayer closets and delight in him without ever sharing our incredible discovery with anyone else? After our conversion, God leaves us here on earth for a purpose, and that purpose is to fulfill the Great Commission to the best of our ability, taking the good news to a lost world. For a disciple of Jesus, there is no greater calling. There's nothing more important or more exciting than helping another person understand the biblical plan of salvation, as presented in the Great Commission, teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded us. And when you get a bunch of us together, we are happy and excited to talk about the victories God is granting us. And we want to know how we might do better. We're open to being discipled about our evangelism. It's for the benefit of our shared mission. This is why I think there's a way that accountability can work in a congregation of fired up disciples. They're ready for the challenge, probably even hungry. Accountability is the furthest thing from a nuisance. It becomes one of the means by which I get to share all that I'm discovering and all the victories God's giving us as I complete my small part in God's grand plan. It's not an annoyance, it's a gateway to riches. If you think accountability is intrusive and threatening, who are you protecting? Why so defensive? Why not celebrate and talk about what the Lord is doing in your own personal ministry to the glory of the church? It's not about you. It's about building God's kingdom on earth. God loves us and has given us his Holy Spirit. This is cause for overwhelming celebration. Hide my light? Never. Keep silent? Impossible. Stay still? Not for a moment. Hide in the shadows? No way. We are a city on a hill. Let your light shine so brightly that men see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, as we leave our study of the Great Commission, let's do a quick review. The Great Commission is presented to the apostles at the close of Jesus' earthly ministry. The purpose of the commission was designed to provide a way for Jesus' ministry to continue after his departure. 
His expectation, as explained in the commission, is that all of his teachings should be passed down to each generation of new disciples and that all of the commands were to be obeyed. These four commands are Jesus' only plan of salvation. The commands in order are go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything. If we have obeyed the gospel, we should be following and teaching this exact same plan of salvation ourselves, not some other man-made plan of salvation. The Great Commission presents the only authorized and legitimate plan. We also clearly see from the Great Commission and John 14 that the promise comes as a result of our humble obedience and is not available to anyone who has not followed Jesus' instructions and commands. God will give us his Holy Spirit if we obey his teaching. This means we do not receive the Holy Spirit at some point in time before our obedience. This fact is consistent throughout all of Scripture. God never gives his Holy Spirit to someone who has not obeyed him. As disciples, we are in the process of implementing the Great Commission at a personal level. We will go, we will make disciples, we will baptize those disciples we make, and we will teach them to do exactly the same things that we are doing. There's nothing complicated here. If someone refuses to obey Jesus' teaching, they reject his plan. As we have seen so many times, a disciple makes disciples, and in fact, there is no other kind of disciple. Well, this brings us to the end of our mini-series about the Great Commission. Thanks so much for joining me on this tour. As we close, I want to leave us with this one final thought. I believe Jesus created the Great Commission as his final marching orders to the troops. He gave us the Great Commission to guarantee that his ministry would be carried on throughout all generations. The Commission is just as valid and powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago, and it still presents four commands, not suggestions. It's never changed, and no one has the authority to make alterations to it. The Commission lays out in no uncertain terms how disciples of Jesus should carry on the Lord's work. The Commission defines the purpose and behavior of the church and the individual disciple. Its instructions are clear and unambiguous. Every true follower of Jesus Christ must have this as the central focus of their life and doctrine. Disciples make disciples. Now, this is not some kind of legalistic formula for church and personal productivity. It's not a rote, mechanical, repeatable plan for church success which points to numbers of baptisms rather than numbers of truly changed, born-again souls. Before someone obeys the Great Commission, we count the cost of following Jesus with that individual. Why do we do this? Well, remember, it's because the missing ingredient in the modern church and its failed message is lordship. Folks who wish to follow Christ must stand in the waters of baptism and truthfully say, Jesus is Lord. This means they take on for themselves the exact same mission as Jesus. There's never been anything like the Great Commission established in any other religion. It's not just a nice ideal. The Great Commission is a gift to those who truly want to be a disciple and make disciples. It's an absolutely amazing and exclusive way to participate in the ministry of Jesus. If we want to be true disciples of Jesus, our goal is to obey Christ to the best of our ability by fulfilling his final wishes and instructions. He provides the plan. Our job is to possess a humble, teachable heart that will take specific biblical action. Folks, the course and activities of our lives change if we are truly born again. There's nothing we can do which will ever, ever be more important than helping another person get to heaven. Nothing. Everything else pales in comparison to the glorious promises offered by the Great Commission. We must be about the Master's business, not our own. And the only way we can possibly do all of this is if we truly possess 
a faith that obeys. Well, thanks for listening and watching. Join the argument at www.faiththatobeys.org slash blog.